Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another video. This is another paid request. This time for Andrew. Thank you so much for that. And for those interested in requesting any type of videos, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. And this is for the film Shock Treatment from 1981, which is kind of a sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show because it does have the characters of Brad and Janet. Only this time you don't have Susan Sarandon and you don't have, oh god, I forgot his name. Does that guy, I think he was doing films like Mega Force, and then Susan, Susan Sarandon was becoming, I guess, a little bit more of a star, she, so she wanted a bit more money. And they said no. So they got Jessica Harper as Janet, and they got Cliff DeYoung as Brad. No Tim Curry. Although... Maybe those thoughts of bringing Tim Curry in for a different role. I thought I read somewhere that at one point they thought, well, what if Tim Curry was Brad? Was that would have been funny, but and maybe better. But shot treatment, Brad and Janet after the events of Rocky Horror Picture Show, their marriage is on the rocks, and they've gone to this town named Denton, and Janet's family, her parents are there. And pretty much mo all the film takes place in this one TV station. Just for understand, the gist of the movie was supposed to be that the entire town, kind of like the Truman Show later on, the entire town is like this one big TV show where everybody's in on it. And it was going to go through the whole town, but they couldn't afford it, so now the whole town is just in this one studio. But all, the whole town wants to be part of this TV show. And it's trying to be a take on TV, celebrities, advertising, how far would you go to get fame and recognition. Sort of an ode later on to reality TV and how that works. I would say I didn't mind the film. It was a film where, how do I put it, compared to Rocky Horror, Horror Picture Show, Rocky Horror has songs that really become iconic, in particular the time warp, but the second half of that movie becomes really mundane and the, even the songs don't quite work. Here, I think it does a better job with more consistently entertaining songs. Also, I think with Rocky Horror, the, first, the last half of that movie, it gets very uninteresting. Here, the fact it all takes place within this TV station, how who's on camera, who's not on camera, it makes it a little bit more interesting for that underlying theme of how far would you go if you desire fame, being seduced by fame and stardom, there's a little bit more meat to the matter compared to Rocky Horror on that level. On the flip side, I thought that like I said that the songs are pretty decent in shot treatment, but there's not a song for me that really sticks out as much as Time Warp. And also, you can really feel the the lack of presence of Tim Curry. And then you realize just how important Tim Curry was to Rocky Horror. Massive, talented uh, individual in that movie. So you definitely feel that loss. And I was really big on Cliff the Young as Brad. I, I liked the, the guy in the, the first one. Bosswork? Barry Bosswork? Lose the actor's name. I'm usually bad with names and get them wrong. But I would say I like Tim Moore's Brad. Here, when he's br when he's playing Brad, Cliff Dion, it's just more awkward. Like they're on the they're part of the audience and Brad's like Ooh, Are you I am Sam? I mean You want me to pull out that cliff of Robert Downey Jr. and Tropic Thunder? Never go full what? 
So it just, I wasn't sure on it. Jester Harper, I will say, uh, Susan Sarandon had a bit more of the wide-eyed innocence, but Jester Harper, for what was required, definitely had more of that intensity of wanting to desire fame. And Prudred Senior, good-looking lady as well. So I did like Jester Harper. I'd probably say I like Jester Jessica Harper more, but then I like the Brad in the first one more, and Richard O'Brien comes back, and I forget the actress's name who was with him on Rocky Horror, she comes back as well, and there's some pretty good camera work, uh, earlier on there's a big tracking shot that's going over the whole studio, pretty much in this 360 very hard shot to pull off. I said the the songs are a bit still a bit catchy. I do think it's more consistent in their quality compared to Rocky Horror. Because like I said by the second half, didn't give a shit about any of those songs. Here whether it be the beginning about Denton and how much they love Denton. Denton Denton but uh, Denton Denton but uh, as some of the lines of dialogue, like one of the intolerance for ethnic races in Denton. I'm like, that could be a parody for today about how trying to... Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? There's a certain word I'm thinking, I can't think of it though. It is just some type of thing that would be said nowadays just to look much better and look much more prominent than they really are. And really bury the lead, so to speak, on it. So after the setup and the songs and all that, Janet has pretty much brought her husband Brad to be part of this game show called Marriage Maze. And the host... The host seems like, remember Man on the Moon? Like, remember Andy Kaufman? And he had that other character with the hair and the glasses and the suit. And he was like this fat comet that just talked his shit to everybody. I forget the, the name of that persona he had. Uh, that's what it seemed like this person was doing. Only with a much heavier accent. And he kind of honestly made me not like Janet as a character because she doesn't really specify a whole lot as to what Brad has done to deserve all this. Like Janet just says, oh, he's an emotional cripple, but why? How? And you think, okay, after the shit you went through and watching her picture show, can you blame him? And how come you're not affected by it? And you're telling me it's all him and none on you? And there's never really a moment between those two characters where they really discuss as to what brought down this marriage, how their marriage came to be, how their marriage became at this point of time. And you don't really get it because after that whole bit of business, Cliff the Young is pretty much put into a holding cell for most of the fucking movie and doesn't really get to talk much until the end of the movie. At least as that character Brad. So it just makes me just hate the Janet character and go, wow, this lady seems like a fucking bitch. Is she a Jada Pinkett? Is she an Amber Heard? And it's not just her Harper's fault, but just the way the character... Like I said, the story could have been improved in, in a variety of ways. But it's more about the, the style, the, the weirdness, and the songs. That was interesting, like... They're on this show, and they're trying to talk, but then it's like they keep looking over, there's all these advertisements for what they're selling, and it's like they have to keep making up a song for what they see. So like Cliff the Unseas Toaster's like, Oh, Toaster, don't you put the bird on me? Bitching in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom all night. I mean, for how weird the lyrics are, it's actually, again, 
they, they do make it rather catchy. And I do think they did a better job with the, the song work in this movie. Again, just nothing ever became as iconic as Time Warp. And you do have, like you said, you have Richard O'Brien coming back. Who is the Edor type of character in Rocky Horror. Here he plays Dr. Cosmo. I believe you have the, the guy who n narrated the movie and was like the professor or whatever. He comes back as another character. They put Cliff the Young in a terminal war with padded walls. And he's there for most of it. And pretty much the rest of it is Janet kind of being pulled into this subduction of fame. Where your head... Bad guy, I guess sort of it's... It's replacement for Tim Curry. Is Cliff the Young playing a different character? And just not nearly as effective as Tim Curry. Not nearly as effective. He even sees a song about... You messed it with an ace! And it's not that Cliff the Young did a bad job as that character. Because he... He has a little bit more to do compared with the, him playing as Brad, but... I don't know. I, I guess I just would have preferred a different actor. I don't mind Cliff the Young. He was doing this 80s film called Pulse. His singing, if that's him singing, isn't too bad either. It just, uh, I'm just not sure about. There's a reason why it's Clifty on playing both roles that does come into the plot later on, so there's a reason for it. And then the other songs, you have like Janice's dad saying a song about men and men should be the misters, the masters of their sisters. I'm not going to say the word, but there's a rhyme that rhymes with maggot. But it starts with an F. It's like, we mm, are maggots. Thank God I'm a man. I will say, like, that song, it did kind of make me laugh, that song. Yeah, I admit. And like I said, there's some decent camel work. There's a bit where each of the characters are in a window... And during the song, it'll go to one window, and it keeps panning to this one, and it keeps panning to this one. And each person gets their moment to the shine, to the sing. And like I said, Brad is getting more sedated, while Jan's getting more seduced by stardom. And you probably have one of the, the bigger songs on the soundtrack. Shot treatments, you're jumping like a real live wire. Shot treatment. Like I said, the soundtrack was one of the big positives of the film. You do wish they had a little bit more budget to be able to get out of the studio. They just didn't have that. The story kind of lose a bit of luster when it got to the middle half. Kind of like Rocky Horror Picture Show for me. When I got to the middle onward, it just kind of, like I said, lost. I don't know, maybe Richard O'Brien is just not good with second halves of his movies. He's just not good with payoffs. It's like he has enough of a story for maybe like a, an hour-long endeavor, but then, or 45 minutes. But after that, it's like he's trying to stretch stuff out, and he's kind of just going around in circles. And then by the end of this, pretty much, you find out that the bad guy and Brad are twin brothers. And the evil Cliff the Young did all this because he was jealous about the good Cliff the Young. And this is a bit where they're seeing the song where the one guy goes, You lost your heart, you lost your cause, you lost it, babe, but you lost your balls. <laughs> Now, the ending kind of almost feels like a little bit of a clusterfuck. Spoilers, because... Spoilers. Because pretty much what happens at the end is... 
some people get Clifton, Clifton, the Brad, his Brad character gets out, kind of crashes the studio party. They both look at each other. Janet seems all of a sudden is now with her husband. I mean, she has been talking about her husband the whole time. She's been kind of whacked. Was she's pretty much treated her husband like shit the whole fucking time. Like, we still don't get much of a good explanation as to why she's so adamant against her husband. She just keeps saying emotional cripple, but what does that really mean in terms of details? Uh, you tell me there's no issues with you looking in the mirror, Janet, nothing with yourself. And her... The, the way her tears are portrayed, it seems like she would fall for the more evil Cliff Dion, honestly. You see, that would be the more believable choice, but for her to just go back to the Brad, it didn't feel, it felt false, it felt phony, it didn't feel earned. Does the Janet character just felt like just a selfish bitch? She really did, she's just, the whole movie like the selfish bitch, and then, nope, never mind, now she's gonna be bad with Brad. I'm like, I don't buy it. Or in fact, if I was Cliff Dion, I was, if I was Brad, I'd be like, fuck you. You had me sedated the whole goddamn time. You barely even wanted to talk to me. Even when you did, like, you just dance around and you see that they're sedating me with a straight jacket. And I mean, you could call someone an emotional cripple doesn't mean you sedate someone with a fucking straight jacket. <laughs> and if she didn't know certain things, she certainly didn't give much of uh, shit to look that deep into it. And then the bad guys win because they talk about how they're going to take over the world with their dent and TV, and they are. Because the evil Cliff Dion, he kind of laughs and walks away. And you just say it kind of a fun bit of the clueless audience falls for the spell of TV and stardom, which a lot of people do, and they, they fall into the belief system. So the finale, like, they're all in straight jackets. They're all awaiting shot treatment. So it does show how a lot of times the audience will be clueless. And a lot of times an audience will be just going along with what the, what the people on TV said. Or, which, I mean, that could be a, applicable to audience today. Not all, but, you know, a chunk of them. But it's just, it still feels like, it just feels like a bit of a clusterfuck. And then our main characters gets with these couple other characters, and then some other random orderlies that for some reason join them in this car, and they drive out of the studio, and then, then the movie's over. And, I don't know, it just, it was okay to watch. Kind of like how I felt about Rocky Horror Picture Show. They were both more interesting in the first half. Uh, there's more iconic songs in the Rocky Horror, but there's more consistently catchy songs and shot treatment. There's some pretty decent camera work. And singing. It was interesting to watch. But they're not really films I care to watch again. I do think Richard O'Brien, like his stories, like he'll have a setup, but then I don't think he has enough for a full length feature film, at least to me. Because like the story kind of falters and it meanders. It felt like by the middle the story was kind of meandering and going, okay, now what are you going to do with this now? Like, where are you going with this now? I think there's a lot more satire on rea on TV that could have been even more milked out of it. At least to me. About advertisements and... I mean, like you would have in Robocop with the fake crazy commercials. Even the Running Man. Climbing for dollars. You know, that type of stuff. And here's the board game. You know, or that game show. Of the Running Man. So I, 
it was okay. It was interesting to watch, uh, but I would never watch it again. I might listen to the soundtrack again because uh, that's definitely a big plus for it. Richard O'Brien, I thought he did a good job as Dr. Cosmo, but I thought he did a good job in the first movie as well. I said Jessica Harbour was a... Her, I had no issues with her acting, very beautiful and very solid singer. Her character is pretty unlikable. Uh, Cliff DeYoung as Brad is just awkward. Anytime I kept seeing them, for some reason, I kept thinking of the song, Bloody Wee 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 Science. Bloody Wee Wee Science. I don't know why. I kept looking at his hair, his, like, white afro, and, or what the hell you call it, and just, uh, thought it was just too... And Tim Kerr is definitely missed. But I said the the actual plot of the reality, sh the, the show, that plot seemed a bit more interesting than the making a guy Frankenstein type in Rocky Horror. I will say, like, the, the underlying theme and, and plot was more intriguing than Rocky Horror. So I'll give it that. So it makes the second half a little bit more watchable than the second half of, of Rocky Horror Picture Show. So if you ask, like, which I like more, I, I don't know. I'm kind of on the same level for for different reasons. But it was still, you know, worth at least one watch. So with that said, thanks for watching. Take care, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.